Okay, well, welcome back, everybody, to our next uh, Looking Through a Glass Onion at the Beatles. And we're looking back to the time of uh, I Am the Walrus off of Magical Mystery Tour. My good friend James Corbett is joining me for this, as usual, and it's wonderful to have you here, James. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad that we decided on this, because as you will remember from last time, there was a bit of debate. Should we do this album or should we skip over it? No, we should do this to do I Am the Walrus, which is, of course, an all-time Beatles classic. Yes, in fact, in the comments section, somebody got aggravated with my comment about uh, about uh, the Magical Mystery Tour is kind of a half album. They didn't like that. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. It's... Half of it's like singles they already released. Yeah, I mean, it's just full of all that, you know, timeless, classical, absolutely god-tier level music. I mean, it's a secondary <laughs> album for the Beatles. Right, okay, well, so yeah, we're going to discuss I Am The Walrus, and uh, let's just kind of talk about, there's so much around this song, you know. In fact, I thought this, we could actually, we won't, but we could actually have done this in two or three, even three parts. It's so rich with trivia and music theory and everything that goes on with all this. So let's uh, let's talk about this. You know, let's uh, let's kind of get into it. I'll start off by saying that McCartney had no hand in the writing of this, and that he actually I am surmising he never gave his opinion about the song, as far as I recall. But during an anthology, I, I believe it was, he said that. Uh, the, the flop that was the movie, Magical Mystery Tour, he goes, well, you know, at least there's a, a performance of I Am the Walrus in it. So he must have liked the song, you know. So, yeah. Um, other bits of uh, interesting Actually, facts? Okay, here's some things I don't know. Maybe you uh, were yeah. looking this up. Um, I don't know when this song was written. Yeah, that's a good question, but it, uh, from what I get, it was, see, let's talk about that, because there's the psychedelic thing, I'm sure you've read that, like, a few of the taglines, when, when we talk about lyrics, a few of the taglines, you know, Lennon came out and said, oh, I wrote that when I was a high on LSD, right? But this is the first song they recorded after they came back from their 10-day retreat with the Maharishi, all right, so... I don't know the exact date the song was written. Probably, you know, a Beatles, true Beatles nerd would. Um, but uh, the way I see it, it's like really at the very end of the summer of love. It's literally getting into winter time. And to me, the song kind of signifies a change. I remember even when I first heard it, I felt a change in the Beatles, a change in the zeitgeist of the culture at that moment, you know. Um, so yeah, do you, you don't you don't have any idea when it was I recorded? don't know exactly when it was written. No, um, I thought I recalled you saying it was, um, or maybe I read it somewhere. Maybe it was shortly shortly after they met the Maharishi, but before they went to India, obviously. Oh, uh, what I got was that they came back from India. It was right after. Remember that moment when Brian Epstein they got the news that Epstein died and they were coming out of the airport. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they met. So that was when they met Maharishi in Bangor, Wales, right? Before, yeah, well, right. before they went to India, they didn't. Before or, they went jo to India. George had been to India, but the, right. the the whole band then went later. But so yeah, I remember, and they were interviewing, and and John's just looks completely yeah, utterly like, shocked. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I just, you know, I want to talk about the whole vibe of this song because I don't call this a psychedelic song. Believe it or not, as weird and outrageous as it is, I consider this more the not psychedelic as much as it is absurdist. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the time that John was hanging out with the Maharishi in Wales, chances are very, very likely that the Maharishi insisted that they don't take drugs during that. So this is a clear-minded Lennon now, and if you notice in his voice, his, the way he presents the song, it means back to his cynical self. It's no longer the soft... I read the news today, oh boy, type of feeling. It's more like, you know, John being pissed off and rock and rollish, you know, with rock and roll attitude. Yep. Yeah, I get the same sense. This is not, yeah, as psychedelic and crazy as it is, it's not a psychedelic song. 
right yeah absurdist is the best way to put it and uh that obviously comes through in every aspect of its production and writing and all of the aspects of it right if you look at a vague set of lyrics like uh uh strawberry fields there's a cohesion to the song you know the lyrics there's cohesiveness even though they're kind of like this way and that way and kind of the the whole vibe is inside of the lyrics but here everything is just whatever it's like all over the map and in fact lennon said about this song you might have run into the quote uh uh where uh, yeah it, it was his response to bob dylan and he said uh he gets away with murder i can write that crap too <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things when you um uh, when you listen to the John Lennon anthology box set they put out back in the 90s, uh, and there's all the outtakes and things like home recordings that he was noodling around it, and there's this one section on, I think, the disc four of that set where it's just like three songs in a row that are just him doing a rambling Bob Dylan impression kind of thing, just literally, <laughs> literally reading the newspaper, like literally. Yeah. And Nixon went over to China today, and he's doing it in the Bob Dylan voice and everything, and it was just... Yeah. It's hilarious, but you definitely get the sense that John was very irritated with Dylan at that point. I think like sometimes, and not always, but often, like the, the people we begin to hero worship eventually become people we despise, you know, so. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so anything else about the context of when the song was coming out? So. Magical Mystery Tour came out like around Christmas 67, 68. What, what year are we 67. It's 67 and the year hadn't changed to 68 yet, which I consider important because 68 was the year from hell. It was an awful year, as you know. And uh, I think that was like that song was the pivotal point when everything started going down. The hippies no longer dressed in fashionable Carnaby Street. Now they're looking like cavemen you know, like a Woodstock and just going into this primitivism and the music changed entirely at that point. There was more like power, power trio, like cream and bands like this were starting to come up. Uh, so no longer that kind of meticulous British, you know, everything is refined vibe. Now they're just going all out and hard. Yeah. 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 There's definitely a sense of the shift that's going on. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there were some influ influences around them, Maharishi being one, Donovan was hanging out with them at this point, the folk singer, and he taught them the finger picking that they used on the White Album. Right, but he taught them, as far as I'm aware, he taught them in India. And, and, and in India, yeah, but by then they were probably hanging out. because I, I think they, yeah, they definitely knew though. each other at that point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, there was Magic Alex came into the fray, uh, Magic Alex being the pseudo-electronic genius and promising all sorts of incredible inventions that he never once came through with a single thing and just cost them money, really. <laughs> yeah, funny how that happens when you get fame and fortune and suddenly there's all these people. Just give me money. I'll make it all fun. And, yeah. Now, one, one point I want to make is the always snobby Frank Zappa, who thought he was like so far above anything anybody else was doing. Uh, he was brilliant. Uh, he was brilliant. I don't particularly like his music, but he was brilliant. The music of his that I did like was orchestral works. They were absolutely phenomenal. And he should have just done that. I don't like his rock music at all. But, you know, that's just my taste. I'm sure people will complain that I should like Zappa or something. Um, but anyway, Zappa liked this song so much that you could go onto YouTube and find live performances of I Am The Walrus done by Frank Zappa. Makes sense. Absurdism. Yeah, yeah I get it. Long prior to Yoko stepping up on stage with Frank Zappa and John Lennon. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. No, it makes sense. Yeah. There's definitely. Yeah. This song. Yeah. It, it'd be interesting to reflect on the kind of the the impact and cultural legacy of this song. It's clearly mm. one of the Beatles' recognizable numbers that people would even today probably know, even if they don't know the Beatles, they probably know something about this song, at least the chorus. Yes, and I'm gonna. I I have I always love to read the the really nasty reviews about Beatles songs, and I I, I saved one, and I want to read it. Uh, in a highly unfavorable review of uh, Magical Mystery Tour, Rex Reed of Hi-Fi Stereo Review said, 
I am the walrus defies any kind of description known to civilized man. <laughs> Not only is it ugly to hear, lacking any cohesion of style or technique, but it, it is utterly silly and pointless. Uh, and then he ends the thing by saying, the whole thing fades out to what sounds like people being fried on, ele <laughs> fried on electric fences and pigs rooting in a bucket of swill. <laughs> Yep, that's it. <laughs> I have to look up that magazine because, you know, the classical guys just hated the Beatles for a long time. And I, I, that might have been a classical magazine. I, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, James, I, I kind of uh, asked you and you so generously went for it. I asked you, I tasked you with uh, looking into the lyrics and some of the stuff around the lyrics. So maybe you want to go into that a bit? Yes, well, I am not going to take the bait of trying to sort out this mess of nonsense lyrics, because, of course, that is the bait. And I think it is famous, infamous at this point, that uh, Lennon wrote this specifically as a nonsense song, specifically as an F.U. to some of the, the uh, critics out there who are apparently taking his stuff way too seriously. And so this stems uh, from a letter that was written to him by someone who was attending Quarry Bank High School, which was his old high school where he started the Quarrymen. Um, and this person was saying something like his teachers were t uh, teaching about the lyrics of the Beatles or something. And Lennon thought that was so stupid. Like people are, now they're actually, students in my old school are learning about the lyrics that we're writing off here. This is ridiculous. I'm going to show them. I'm going to make something so ridiculous they'll never be able to analyze exactly. it. Exactly. And that's, <laughs> that's, at least that's the story of this mm -hmm. song. But <laughs> as you might imagine, there are some... Uh, alternative interpretations that have been proffered in the conspiracy space now and and real world references by the way too like in other words right i'm sure you've looked into that so i'll let you uh, well okay let me let me bring up one example of this so um i did find this article about uh how i am the walrus is really about genocide and delighting in genocide and this i you know I, I kind of want to believe there's something here, but I uh, find it difficult to. So, um, for example, this author is taking things like uh, the opening lines, I am he, as you are he, as you are me, uh, and, and saying that this is a clear reference to marching to Pretoria, I'm with you and you're with me and we are all together, which is a line in Marching to Pretoria, which is an old, I guess, British folk song about the Boer War. And... Then he starts picking that apart. So, okay, the Boer War, well, piggies and fleeing from a gun. Well, piggy is clearly a reference to boar, boar, boar war. It's a play on words, uh, you know. And, okay. All and right. so he starts picking that apart. And then he's looking at the, uh, the ostensible, I mean, what even John would admit, the walrus coming from the walrus and the carpenter, Lewis Carroll. And he's saying, well, yeah, but in the, and it, Lennon's, phrase that people will quote is that he said oh I picked the wrong guy I, I just I was just looking and I, I thought it was absurd the walrus okay but I should have picked the carpenter because he was right. putting it in this capitalist framework whatever but uh, this guy's saying no 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 but in that in that poem uh, they're both committing genocide so really he's still on the side of genocide with this song and he picks it apart from this perspective and really starts I think stretching it uh, I'm not convinced Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Goo Goo Gajoob comes from uh, Finnegan's Wake uh, from uh, James Joyce, where mm -hmm. clearly, you know, Joyce is referring to the Four Horsemen of the po Apocalypse in that pas passage where this comes from, or at least this comes from. Uh, Cramp for himself and co Esquera, or them four horsemen on them ap Apocalypse, Norhees, Soothbees, Reates, and Wilkes, and glary bit of the scenes in Hevel, there was a crick up the Sturcus, and when she runs the cankle to see, Gallory, down and she went on her knees to bless her, if there was noggin together like milk juggles, as it was the rake of the Hespersus, or old Kong Gander O'Toyle of the mountains, or his goo goo goose. Th she seeing silver off of the Saudis lobby out the back, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wow. it's Finnegan's Wake. If you haven't read Finnegan's Wake, <laughs> it is hundreds of pages of gobbledygook um, that every single word has like 17 different references. And it, you know, it's a play on words with this and it means this and it's an allusion to this. And it's also the name of a river in Austria. <laughs> <laughs> so 
you can read a lot of things into any passage of Finnegan's Wake. And then even to say that Goo Goo Gajub comes from Goo Goo Goose the which is what is written in Finnegan's Wake. Is that true? Did he say that? Did Lennon ever say that? Or is he just stretching his... So anyway, this is an example, I think, of people really want to find the the, the, the hidden message in here. Um, and, mm-hmm. I, 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 you know, whatever. I am a conspiracy researcher, so I understand, yeah, sometimes the things can be hidden in plain sight and all of that kind of stuff. But also, I know you can play with people by implanting a, a conspiracy. Oh, you know, I'll make I'll make some tantalizing clues here to lead people down a rabbit trail and it oh, goes yeah. nowhere. And then you end up, oh, well, that was fun. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, I, I tend to believe that John was playing with people with this. I don't think this yeah. is some sort of grand message of genocide or whatever or anything oh, along that's... those lines but there is also of course the biggest embedded clue of all in here which i think might per- pertain to something you're going to talk about which is the walrus is paul right 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 which of course comes from glass onion right 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 yeah and and he purposely threw that in glass onion to like Okay, he's being totally cynical there. Here's another clue. Yeah, yep. go, go Here's another it. clue for you all. Yeah, exactly. He's throwing it in their face. Like, hey, keep on chasing that tail that we're leaving here. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny, man. I, I When I was a kid, I was about, uh, I guess, 13 years old at the time. And me and I had this nerdy friend. Uh, and one day we were talking about I Am the Walrus. And we actually tried, to, we went line by line and tried to figure out what the song meant. Did you have any luck? What did you find? Yeah, Here's yeah, my question. I, I, what did you come up I, with? Semi- what did you come up with for Semolina Pilchard? Yeah, uh, that's where that Semolina Pilchard. Um, we didn't actually. I think that's where we stopped because we were at a loss. You know, it was like we were, you know, we were going on a long time about Elementary Penguin, though. Uh, that I do recall, but uh, yeah, no, Semolina Pilchard. I never even liked that line for some reason. It's just so obtuse. But anyway, yeah. Um, also, you know, I just happened if I cannot find it. I wanted to dig it up and put it in the show notes. I, I accidentally was going through my YouTube, you know, recommendation, recommended videos. And one was called Magri- Magical Mystery Tour. And it was a group like Gnostic Meteor, Gnostic something or other. And these guys are the far conspiracy theorists, like the Paul is dead and, you know, the Beatles were Illuminati and all this whole, whole stuff. It was, it was, re- it got to be really funny after a point, especially the Paul is dead part. But uh, I, I so wish I could have added that to the show notes at the bottom, but I could not dig it up, unfortunately. Anyway, go on. No, no, no. I think that's about all I have to say about this. I'm not going to go into the weeds of every single line, but I am interested to hear what you did come up with for Elementary Penguin. I, I don't, I, honestly, I don't remember. That's a long, long time yeah. ago. <laughs> long time ago. Yeah, fair um, enough. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you didn't exactly crack the code. Again, I don't think there's a code to be cracked here. But let's talk about some of the real world, world references. The Eggman. Do you know about the Eggman, who the Eggman was? I do not. Who all was right. the Eggman? I heard two versions of the story. The one I remember is from uh, Hugh McDonald's Revolution in the Head. Eric Burden from the Animals, the band The Animals, was apparently a friend of the Beatles. And he was talking with John one day, and uh, he was talking about having sex with this woman. And one of his, his favorite things to do was crack an egg on her belly and then have sex with her. I, I have no idea why. I think I but, have heard that story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the other version is that she wanted to have the egg cracked on her belly or something like that. But, you know, one way or the other, whatever that is. Um, let me see. I don't know if I have any other notes about the lyrics. One thing that did you happen to run into? I'm curious. Like, you know how John and Paul would quibble over who gets the A side? Yeah. Right. I'm just, this was the B-side of Hello Goodbye. Oh, and I, <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, you know, it was always, John would say, well, no, it should be my song, you know. 
uh, in his in his this case, I agree. But you know, at the same time, at this point in the Beatles' career, who gives a crap if it's on A or B? Yeah. I mean, really, it's know? still going to sell a billion and be played on every station in the world. Yeah, true. But to be fair, if you've got those two songs, especially in the context in '67, which is more commercial? Yeah. Clearly, yeah. "Hello Goodbye." Literally, because that's been used in commercials, hasn't it? So Yes, indeed. It, it definitely, I think that was probably on George Martin's, um, you know, advice. Yeah, well, I, who was managing in that interim before Apple was set up? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Who was making the business decisions at that point? Yeah, exactly. Um, but probably there was cross... Well, see, Epstein, Epstein had just died, too, though. Yeah, um, exactly. So who was in charge at that point, right? Who yeah, was making that yeah. decision? What's going to be the A? What's going to be the B? Oh, I have one other bit of trivia about the lyrics. This blew my mind when I heard about this. I don't know if you know about the Maharishi system, but basically he'd give a personal mantra to each person who attended. Basically, he'd suss out where they're at and give them a special mantra that's just theirs. But he always said, he warned them, he said, do not tell anybody what your mantra is. And supposedly, I read this somewhere, that Lennon's secret mantra is embedded somewhere in uh, I Am The Walrus. So I've heard it's, don't tell anyone, Jai Guru Deva Om. <laughs> really? You heard that? No, no just making that but up. wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> like, oh, don't tell anyone. Okay, <laughs> let me make a song about it. it. It could be just as simple as Hare Krishna because the, the lyric is actually in there. Yeah, uh, true. I, I, I've always thought that that's probably because, of course, George was getting super into that stuff at that moment. And I'm sure they were hearing it. And it's just a, if you're coming up with nonsense lyrics, oh, that's a funny sounding thing. Yep, yep. So, yeah, um, even though a lot of the lines were pulled from psychedelic periods, and in fact, I think you probably read this song is like three songs that he kind of put together based on some lines he wrote, like, uh, uh, Mr. City, Policeman City. That's supposed to be a reflection of the sound of a police alarm, right? And uh, I can't remember the other line. It, it's the beginning of one of the verses, but... Uh, it, he claimed he wrote that, he got that line when he was on acid, you know. So it's a song in three different parts. And uh, I suppose we could segue into the music theory part of this and that whole trip. Let's do it. Um, now, I should say that I remember watching your um, original breakdown of this from a decade ago or whenever that's posted up on your old YouTube channel. Um, and by the way, we should tell people, if you're watching on YouTube, please watch on library. Vinny is now on right, library. Exactly. His entire channel I'll, is backed up there, so you can go there. Um, I'll put the uh, link in the show notes when, yeah. when it... Uh, yeah. But I remember... Uh, I, I, I haven't watched it in several years now, but I remember from that video that you were describing the intro, uh, the very interesting introduction here, in terms of wandering majors, which I know is not a term that you use anymore. Right. So uh, let's update that for parallel relative switch. Is that what's happening here? Yeah, uh, the, the, all right, we're, we're going to, I just learned a new snobby classical term that I really like. It's called the Aeolian Ascent, but it can also descend. The problem that, uh, with this is that it completely defies, this introduction defies music theory. From It starts on a, we got to talk about this intro because it's remarkable. Uh, it starts on a B chord, goes down a whole step to an A chord goes down a whole step to a G chord, goes down a whole step to an F chord, and finally resolves to E, right? So this much, that makes logical sense, but that F is way far away from that B chord. It's a tritone distance away, which in my music theory, the tritone distance is the furthest distance you could go between two notes. My music theory, and I have to explain it, and I won't right now, but... Um, all right, so, uh, yeah, th that when that F chord it comes in, it throws everything off. And you notice how obtuse it sounds right from the get-go, right? Um, now, what we have is uh, on, sounds like a Fender Rhodes. He's playing on keys. And then there. Uh-uh. Now, 
Now, that'd be fine all on its own. It's very melodic. It's very nice. With the chords, it actually kind of justifies these weird chords. But this thing, when I heard a solo version, and by the way, I'm going to post a link to the isolated sections, and it's a real treat, especially the string section is awesome. It's just really awesome, which I just realized we can't play, but uh, we'll get a strike. Well, now that you're on library, we'll keep that in mind for uh, the future. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully there'll be a strong shift over to the library so I never have to worry about this again. Um, all right, so anyway, this line, he, you can hear Lennon play it solo on keyboard. And it, yeah. Now he's playing that da 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 that stuff on, uh, in the melody, but then... When he comes to the third chord, this thing shows up against the G chord, um, which you get this. Really dissonant chord, that's a G major 7 sharp 5. Not a very tenable chord, okay? Um, so, yeah, I, I couldn't, I can't do it on guitar, but if you listen, I think everybody in the world, sir, when you get to the third chord, there's that element of like, what? You know, that what's that dissonant thing, you know? So yeah, that intro is, is uh, remarkable. Uh, now let me go with an overview first, okay? Um, let me see. Uh, and now I neglected to put the intro in here, but this is the, the song when the vocals begin, so... We have an A section, and notice I have A prime and A secondary, right? This, these two A's comprise one verse, okay? But the chord changes in A1 and A2 are completely, are different, okay? And we'll get to that. Now, we typical AABA kind of situation in a sense, we have our A, a prime and A secondary, and then we have A prime and A secondary, but he sticks this little tiny weird bridge in there suddenly that comes out of nowhere and never shows up again. And we'll go over that. Then uh, we come back to the second part of A. So now we have a sandwich with A prime and A secondary. Then we go into the bridge sitting in an English garden, which by the way is reflective of the intro. The intro has taken some of these chords and used it to bring the song in. Then we have A prime and A secondary, and finally the outro, the coda. So um, that's the the overview of that. Now um, I want to talk first, and then I'll demo, I'll show you on a chart. But now in the C scale, all right. Actually, I'm going to bring up the chart. Let me bring it up. I'll share the screen again, and I'll talk over this thing. All right. Now this is the C scale: C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Right. Now, he uses every root in the key of C in this song for all of his chords and only those notes as roots of the chords, right? Now, that would be boring if it was C, D minor, E minor, F, G major, A minor, the way the key of C is properly put together. But he turned the minor chords into major chords. And that's where we get all this obtuse sound. Now, granted, there are some seventh chords that show up, but a seventh chord is a major chord with an added kind of bobble to it. So we can ostensibly say that everything in this song is a major chord, which is very strange. Including the B, which should be a diminished, right? Yes, including the B, which should be a diminished. You've been doing your homework. Yeah, that's quite right. All right, so now, uh, so we have our intro. Uh, 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 now this part, E to E7, D to D7, that is a blues turnaround, right? We'll, we'll see the blues show up again a little later on, which is not surprising because this is a rock tune. This is rock there's no question in his voice you can hear it that kind of he wants to scream again the way he used to in the old days so um let me see uh yeah so let's run through the chords now 
Now, you mentioned the parallel relative switch. In A prime, the first part of the verse, we do have that. We have the chords. to do that um, so what we have is a key of a we're rooted in a I, I don't like to say key but we're rooted in a and if we turn it to a minor and took the chords from the key of C major a minor being the relative minor of the key of C major we have two keys to work with so now when we look at these chords we can see some are from a and some are from C so I have a from the key of a the root chord the G chord, which is the five in the key of C, C chord, which is one, and then D chord is the four of the key of A, and then he repeats those. I'm now comes the next section. Now, my belief is this is a uh, that little motion of chords became very, very popular in later 60s rock, which is the Chicago song. Or, um, It's uh, it's such a travesty that my generation, I think of uh, which great Green Day song is it? But anyway, it's a Green Day song. Oh, yeah, Brainstorm. there's a Green Day song, too. Yeah. Well, the point being that it's a very, very common yeah, line. And yeah, yeah. This, this second section is not parallel relative switch. Well, a little bit, actually, the F. But, um, but this is based more on a line. We're getting... So what we have is an A... Then an A chord with a G bass, which is basically an A7. Then we have a D chord with an F sharp in the bass, a third in the bass, so we could carry the line through. And of course, naturally, it wants to lean to the F. And here is the Aeolian Ascent. Now let me explain the old Aeolian Ascent. Um, even that, it's it's kind of technically technically not aeolian the actual ascent is in the aeolian mode if i'm in the key of if i'm in rooted in a minor that's the only situation where the two major chords rise up to the root chord like that in whole steps that's the only situation that happens in interesting yeah i i call it these three chords <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah they show up all the time and now that i have a name for it i will definitely be able to pick it out right and by the f f g that's part of the parallel relative switch that's part of the key of c the four and five now uh, technically an aeolian ascent should be uh, but of course we're in major where we get the effect of the parallel relative switch now you know or that kind of triumphant ending uh, you know to that uh, sequence so, uh, yeah, that's the Aeolian Ascent. I just, I picked up on that term recently and I just loved it because it's so snotty. It's just so it is, classical. but it's not correct because you're right. It should be in A minor. It should be right, the minor be going up to the minor root. So, no, it's not Aeolian Ascent, really. It's some sort of Aeolian not... Ascent with a parallel relative switch. Yeah. Hmm. Right, right. I think what they're referring to, the Ascent part, is the F and the G chord. I think yeah. just to kind of justify there. But if you're in Aeolian, then clearly you're leading up to a minor root. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, that. All right, so uh, now in the second verse, we go through our A prime. Right 
eyes up when he goes, I'm crying, I'm crying. That's actually blues too. It's just he's suspending that D7. So you get that. But that. So it's a little piece of the blues. And that may only make sense with the Beatles. They were so influenced by Chuck Berry's music and American, uh, you know, R&B and all that. So, yeah. Now, uh, so we have those two sections. Now we have the iteration, reiteration of the, the opening chords on the intro. But now we're going to go a little further with those chords. We have first the violins come in. Uh, 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 sent this time up to E instead of A. All right, so, uh, yeah, um, let me see. Um, oh, you know, I didn't finish uh, A secondary, uh, so that's like sitting on a cloud lake. Again, John had this thing about taking an F chord and bringing it to a B chord. I don't know why. It's real obtuse movement, but he liked it. And it's kind of coolish, you know? It really is kind of cool. Now, when I play the song, I don't play an F major strictly because his melody... So I play it what's called an F Lydian chord, okay? And to make an F Lydian, you play an F, but then you add a raised fourth on top of it, which is a, it's Lydian sound is so characteristic. You can really hear Lydian. Now you, you think of that like an excuse get to E. But instead, he just takes you up the half step to C. Now we go into the ba -da -da -da. And he follows the same Aeolian ascent up to E. Then uh, after that, we have another uh, A prime, A secondary, and then we go to the coda. Now, um, this is where way back when I think you're talking about referencing an old video I did. I bet I mentioned this way back when. The thing that blows my mind is that he's using A major, B major, C major, D major, E major, F major, G major, all majors, right? but in different order throughout the song, right? But when we get to the coda, he does them all in descending order, like he's wrapping the whole thing up saying, yeah, I used all of these chords, and now you're gonna hear them in a row. You know, that, that to me, like, I don't know if he consciously devised that or what, but it's brilliant. It really is a stroke of genius. So, uh, I am the amen. which is the root chord, it feels like it's kicking in there. And interestingly, George Martin picked up on this, and this is so cool. I discovered something really neat with this section, and this is an only Vinnie moment. This is like, 
this guy comes up with the weirdest stuff in music theory, and it's true. I discovered a fascinating thing about this, okay? Now, first of all, George Martin, being a classicist, said, hey, you know what? I'm going to do contrary motions in the upper violins. So when we get down to that A, it takes a minute to get there. Right here, like I told you, when it hits that A, it feels like it's kicking in. Well, why? Because it's the root chord, right? So now the violins immediately start here, and they go, bah. all over. Now, I got a chart for this. So I want you to see this. Jay. This is really so cool what I discovered about this. All right, so here's the coda, all right? Now, so here's the first four bars where it goes E to D to C to B, and then this, I put a double bar here because that's where it feels like it's beginning, right? Now, so this, in the strings, he's playing an A note, then a B note, then a C note, then a D note, then an E note, then an F sharp, then a G, and an A, right? And notice that it starts all over again. As soon as we hit that A, the whole process is going to begin again, right? What I notice is that the song actually starts fading by then. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Now, you know that chords are built in the order of root, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, thirteenth. Now, this must be some mathematical function that's going on here with music, because when we hit the A note, the strings play an A note. That's the root of the A chord. When this, now, mind you, this is diatonic. This is scale steps, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, right? That's just scale steps, right? So the B note against the G is the third of the G chord. The C note against the F is the fifth of the F chord. The D note against the E is the flat seventh of the E chord. Then the E against D is ninth of the D chord, F sharp against C. They play an F sharp there, and it, there's a reason for it. That's the minor ninth rule. He wanted to avoid that note, so he changed F to F sharp. Still allowable, that's called the sharp 11. And finally, the G on the B chord is a flat 13. Root, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, 11, 13. That blew me away. It was like, holy cow, there's some sort of mathematical relationship going on here you have descending major chords and ascending scale at the same time, and you get root, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, thirteenth of each separate chord as it goes up. Do, do you get what Do you get what I'm talking about here? I do. Um, yeah. I do. You, I mean, do you think that was conscious? Do you think George Martin was thinking, "Let's do totally this"? Totally not. Totally not. Totally not. It, you know, there's a saying that the the great composers write and the music theorists come later to to describe what they're doing. And, and to kind of codify, you know, back in the days of Bach, they said, well, you can't have parallel fifths because Bach would never do it, you know, or parallel thirds or parallel octaves. That was all kind of verboten. So the theorists were looking at Bach going, well, why does it sound good? Oh, look, he's not using parallel fifths. Okay, no parallel fifths again, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. right? So, but to me, that was a mind-blowing little moment. Mm. It really blew me away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, just a, a couple of bits about that outro, about that coda, I like to call them. Um, first of all, there's a shepherd tone in there. And when you hear, uh, it's just when uh, at the point, uh, let me see. Um, I am the egg man. Those are both two separate shepherd tones, one going down and one going up. Now, what is a shepherd tone? Shepherd tone, I don't know how they managed to pull this off with a vocal part, but they had to do some messing with the, the mixing board because there are two. All right, let me explain a shepherd tone. A shepherd tone is a musical, like the musical version of an optical illusion. When you play a shepherd tone, it sounds like it's going up and up and up and up forever, but it isn't. It's actually on a treadmill. And the way it works is you have two or more notes and one is rising up. Then you add the other one a little later. And as the one rising up comes up, another one might come in, but we're fading out the volume of the higher one 
And as this one comes up, we're fading out the volume, and it keeps cycling around like that, where it starts loud and gets soft. And I don't know if you, do you have the um, example of a shepherd tone uh, that I sent? Could you would you mind playing that? All right. So I can... yeah. yeah, I got it set up, ready to go. Let's play that right now. That's an ascending one going up. Sounds like it's getting higher and higher and higher, but it's not. Okay. Now, it, I will say this, it, it gets really, really high, it does. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I get it, and uh, it's like an optical illusion. Once it's pointed out to you, I think it doesn't have the same effect. Because I can, now I hear, I know the trick, so it doesn't sound like right, it's going you know up the forever. Trick. For yeah. Anymore. There are some, there are many examples on YouTube and they're really cool to listen. Some are just done with scale notes. So, so you don't hear this big ass chord, you just hear scale notes. And the amazing thing about it is they tell you stop it at any point and then start it again. And it'll still sound like it's taking off from where it left off and like still going even higher. It's mind blowing. So they can ascend or descend. And I remember the first time I saw this video and I got for the life of me, I can't dig it up off of YouTube. Uh, but the, the, the title was, uh, I am the walrus. Once you hear this, you'll never be able to unhear it. And he demonstrates the shepherd tone. And, uh, it, again, there are two of them, one, uh, uh, descending and then one ascending, you know? So I, again, I don't know how they pulled this off. I know they used a chorus. They had a chorus of people and an orchestra, um, but the, to get like that effect but with people going, woo. I don't know how they did it, but it's amazing. Unfortunately, they didn't keep it going, so you can't hear. It just happens for a moment. It doesn't stay through. Probably they figured it was getting in the way. Um, but, yeah. Now, one final fact about this song that really blew me away. You know how we talk about how Paul had this sense of orchestration and a kind of natural music theory built into him, and John was more kind of artsy and... Didn't quite know what he was doing, but he put things together great, you know. Well, guess what? Lennon, or quotes, orchestrated this piece of music. In other words, he told George Martin, I want the strings to play this melody here and that melody here. Believe it or not, John did that. I never knew that. That does that genuinely surprise me. Yeah, yeah. And certainly yeah. he didn't come up with the, uh, the that bridge score, right? I can't sing. Well, I mean, if you know, like I said, I'm going to put in the show notes the isolated tracks, and and it has time markers so you can go to you know what you want to hear. If you listen to the whole string section, you think to yourself, John couldn't come up with all of that. I'm sure George Martin had a lot of leeway in what he was doing. I'm assuming, yeah. You know, John was the type, he didn't understand anything technical. He wasn't that kind of guy. So I'm sure, like, when John said, play this melody, and then Martin does his little things to it, Pretty Lennon enough. probably figured, yeah. oh, he knows what he's doing. That sounds good, you know. Yeah. So, man, I Am the Walrus. This is actually quite an epic piece of music. It really is. I agree. And uh, yeah, that's about it. I think we, I was really worried that we'd do a two hour session tonight rather than a one. I think we covered a lot of the bases. Uh, anything else you want to say about the chord structure or the song in general? Uh, well, let me just display the chord chart so people can look at it. Now, this has everything the intro, there's our blues turnaround, E. Uh, E7 and D7 coming back to the A chord. Now you hear I, here I didn't call it A and A prime, I call it A and B. I uh, did a different form for this, but it's the same deal. This is this is the whole verse. A and B are the verse. But the second time we do A to B, we stick this in the mid. Uh, no, we stick this in the middle of it. 
That's I'm, I'm crying, I'm crying. That's that. We stick this little bit, which shows up nowhere else in the song, in between A and B the second time the verse is iterated. And, uh, yeah, and then finally we have our... Uh, this is our bridge. Da, 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 sitting in an English garden. And, and again, our alien ascent. You know, when you see three... Yeah. And and I think for from the listener's perspective, having the Aeolian Ascent in both the verse and that bridge section, that's clearly the easiest way to create a parallel link that'll make people feel like, oh, okay, yeah. now we're going back. I, I think he did that on purpose, yeah. And that in that particular case, I really think he did that on purpose. He was a very, I think he was very aware of the white keys of the piano because this is what this is based on. The, the roots are all the white keys of the piano. So, um, yeah, you could get F, G to A and C, D to E, right? They're both three whole step, two whole step intervals. So um, he probably was aware of that and, and worked that. I, I wouldn't doubt it, you know. He picked up things intuitive, intuitively, but he did pick them up, you know. It's not like McCartney, where McCartney kind of knew what he was doing. John kind of didn't, but he kind of did in some sort of vague, cloudy way. He you know, John yes. was more intuitive. So, so yeah, yeah. And uh, by the way, this G major seven sharp fives that shows up. Um, that's the first and only time the Beatles ever use that chord ever, ever. Uh, you know, that's like. Mm. One would expect yeah, it's not a yeah. common chord. That's a jazz chord. That's totally in a jazz rock, chord. Anyway. You know, it's a jazz yeah. ending chord, really. Yeah. Um, if you put an E in the bass, it's like a, like James Bond kind of stuff. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So I think that's it, man. I I that I think that wraps up. I am the Walrus. It's amazing. It's an amazing piece of music in so many ways. And so you say when you heard this originally that you could sense the change yeah. that was happening in the Beatles yeah. as well as in the zeitgeist, I assume. Um, was that the way it was generally received? I mean, Buried is the B-side to Hello Goodbye. Maybe everyone thought this was just another continuation of the Beatles pop trend. And, oh, there's that weird little thing. Yeah, I don't think most people were... Uh, I was highly sensitive to whatever the Beatles did. And also being a musician, I was highly sensitive to the sound itself. So... Um, no, that was just my observation. I think the hippies were just like, oh, far out, man. Cool. New weird Beatles song. Dig it. You know. Yeah, little did they know what was coming Yeah, next, you huh? know what? I mean, at the proper time, that song would have been revolutionary, but the Beatles had already broken the mold, you know, so it was like, okay. Yeah, that's actually, that's a good way of putting it. It's like, yeah, that would be an incredible, like, amazing... But I actually don't think of it as so revolutionary just because I see it in the context of the Beatles. Like, I, <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> but if you had put this song down back in the Revolver era, that would have been like, oh my God, what the hell is this thing? You know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. After Tomorrow Never Knows, it's like, okay, they're going to yeah, do anything. Yeah, it, it kind of like opened, especially Pepper. Pepper really opened the, the aperture. It's like, okay, anything goes now. Whatever you want to do, do it. And the hippie musicians did. They did. I kind of wish the psychedelic, kind of frilly, baroque way of doing things, I wish that had lasted longer. I was especially fond of psychedelic music. Uh, like, I liked... Um, uh, strawberry alarm clocks, incense and peppermints. It had that same kind of frilly psychedelic thing that I like so much, you know, and a lot of thought went into the music too. Trippy thought. But, oh. May I make a musical What's suggestion that? for you? What's that? I think you would honestly appreciate the musical stylings of Sean Lennon and uh, his band Ghost of the I, I like what I've heard so far. Uh, he definitely tries for that kind of psychedelic. Good on him, yeah, feel. yeah. And honestly, I feel bad for him because honestly, he is a good songwriter. Genuinely, yeah. on his own merits, he is a good songwriter. But living in the shadow of your father, it's all people yeah. will ever talk about. You know, but he's really cool about it, though. I, I have to say, he's not, you can tell he's not snide or resentful. He really respected his dad. Like, he, um, 
I heard a recent interview with him about his father's right. Oh, oh, it was really great. It was he interviewed was Paul ch- and he interviewed yeah. uh, someone else. I can't remember. Yeah, oh, I didn't catch that one, but I caught the Paul, and uh, it was really wonderful. Like, it oh, was he a interviewed very- Julian, right? Or they talked to. Him. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, Julian wasn't a bad songwriter. He was more pop, you know. Uh, Sean is an art artsy type. Yeah, you know. I never got Julian. into Julian stuff, but Sean's. I gotta admit, I'm a fan. Um, yeah. What was that? Friendly Fire, his uh, solo album. Great album. I love it. And by the way, I want to do a shout out to my buddy Rich Ragsdale, who produced. Uh, what was that? Uh, um, the big one that recently hit uh, Sean Lennon uh, about the rocket scientist oh yeah 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 yeah. Uh, i'm gonna forget the name but i know exactly what you mean uh, blood and rockets i think blood and rockets yeah uh oh the christians went bananas over this thing christian conspiracy theorists went nuts over this because of like all the satanic imagery my friend rich is like yeah he told me to throw it in so i threw it in you know yeah but kind of isn't it's, that the point it's about jpl and uh what's his name yeah um, the that, literal that is, occultist who literally yeah. was at the yeah. roots of what became NASA and all that. Anyway, my buddy Rich, talented, talented guy and a sweet guy, did the animation for that. He did a great job, too. And, uh, you know, I've talked with him about conspiracy theory, and he said to me, oh, you know, he goes, I don't know if I buy into it, man. He goes, you know, people are so busy on music, on uh, on sets of, of movies that nobody has time to put that kind of, you know, extra level into it. I don't completely believe that. I think people do find the time to put that extra level into it because there's it, too yeah. much. It doesn't it, have to be a big coordinated thing. It could be one person who has in, in charge of making yeah. sure that one thing is in that one spot or whatever. Exactly. You know, in Kubrick's case, it was pretty obvious. In Kubrick's case, everything you see on the screen is meant to yes. be there for sure. But yeah, I can, I understand a lot of directors don't quite work that level of detail, but... But, you know, you don't need to have that level of detail. Like you said, you could just have somebody take care of this one little, I want yeah. this and this shot. That's all oh, you need. Oh, you know that prop uh, that we're making for The Matrix? Just make sure that Neo's pa- passport expires on 9-11-2001. Don't ask me why. Yeah, yeah, that's a bizarre one, man. That How about really... uh, The Big Lebowski? I never found that dang thing, man. Um, we should explain for the people who are listening. Uh, so you are telling me that in The Big Lebowski, there's a scene where he's in the taxi, right? And they're listening to the right. Eagles, and he looks at a note that he has scribbled Yeah, yeah there, it was an odd moment, because he looked at a piece of paper and then threw it out the window or something. I forget. And I decided to screenshot, because I wanted to see what it said. And here's the bizarre thing, is that it says... The Eagles are the only band in the Matrix, and green lettering, like this, that green color they use in Matrix. And as you pointed out, The Big Lebowski was before The Matrix was made, so how did that happen? Or at least while it was being made. So, anyway, I, yeah. I, I, I will run into it one day, James. Please I know do. it's somewhere up in my Facebook photos, and every once in a while I accidentally bump into it, so... Or I if anyone out there I'll... has the uh, you know Blu-ray copy of The Big Lebowski and can screenshot that for us... Yeah, do. and and just just so I don't get really bashed, I have a horrible memory, so it could be that I found it in a different movie than <laughs> The Big Lebowski. So, or it could know. be the Mandela effect. It's it never that I have a false memory of something; it's that the universe has been altered. <laughs> yes, yes. That's uh, the most natural, that, logical explanation. <laughs> you and I have to meet up for a conversation after this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got something to talk about with that stuff. <laughs> All right. So. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, before we go, I also want to direct people to, uh, do you know Mike Pacelli? Mike Pacelli has a great, yeah. He does a lot yeah. of Beatles stuff. And I, I just saw one of his recent videos where he's talking about the uh, the unusual chords in yes, with I the Beatles. And yeah. I swear, if you've just listened to an hour conversation about I Am The Walrus, this will be up your alley. Just the sheer joy that he gets out of playing uh, whatever it is, like a C-sharp minor six or whatever. And he just, oh, isn't that so great? It's just infectiously enthusiastic. So I recommend yeah, so that, it. Yeah, that's what I love about him. He's a guy I could have beers with. You know, the three of us ought to go out one time and just have beers. He's in France, you're in Japan, <laughs> I'm in uh, California. But some way we'll figure it out. We'll meet up somehow. 
But yeah, no, I really feel that I love his enthusiasm. You know, it's like he really loves the Beatles and he loves and respects what they do. And, you know, he's he's like a really advanced guitarist. He's not like a hack. So I really appreciate when advanced musicians can can hear what the Beatles are doing, really get it, you know, what they're doing. Because a lot of people don't. A lot of musicians don't. Yeah. Anyway, I think that'll do it for this time. So next time will be White Album, right? Yeah, White Album. Huh. Well, there's plenty to choose from there. No <laughs> lack of songs to choose from. Maybe we should do okay. Glass Onion and follow up on that Walrus is Paul lead, huh? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Uh, we'll see. That's an interesting song. He does some cool stuff in there. Uh, but as usual, I'm going to leave it up to you to kind of root around and see if there's something you like in there that you'd like to hear. Well, let's put it this way. I, I am open to suggestions for anyone out there, but... Only in the library comments, not on the YouTube comments. So find right. Vinny's library channel, follow him, and leave your comment there. Indeed, indeed, yeah. Library spelled L-B-R-Y dot com. It's, uh, That's how you get the app. The L-B-R-Y dot TV is how you can watch. Or Odyssey dot com. O-D-Y-S-E-E dot com. It's confusing, isn't it? Perhaps needlessly so. But anyway, it's not YouTube, which is the important bit. Yes, no censorship. You can do what you want. I won't get my videos muted because I played a Beatles song on it, you know. Or two so, seconds of an isolated track. Like, oh. Uh, oh, my God. You know, yeah, exactly. Too bad I really wanted to play the string part. It's so good. But I advise my listeners then, do check out the link to the isolated tracks on Walrus because the string part is worth the price of admission. It's great. It's really wonderful. George Martin kicks ass he's such a great producer and again you know i thought about what you said to me uh, last last uh, podcast that like what other producer would do this you know what other industry producer yeah. that's all there were in those days yeah. industry yeah, producers yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and here's yeah, martin george martin was just the perfect guy for them um with that kind of comedy background and used to making weird mm -hmm. sounds and stuff so he was mm -hmm. he was an out-of-the-box thinker which fate it was magical. Yeah. It was truly magical combination of elements that brought the whole thing together. Uh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right. Well, anyway, let's wrap it up. Okay, James, have a good one, man. And uh, we'll talk later. And good night, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this long, nerdy discussion of I Am The Walrus. 